Hello and welcome to The Debate, presented jointly in the European Parliament in Brussels by Europol TV and Nova TV from the Balkans. With me, Paul Anderson. And me, Borian Jovanovsky. We'll be discussing the challenges, setbacks, successes, even though sometimes they are hard to see, of the EU's enlargement towards the Western Balkans. The new European Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker, he said, no new members under his watch, but the process rumbles on anyway. With us in the studio are Ivo Weigel from Slovenia, a Liberal MEP, and Eduard Kukan from Slovakia, who's a member of the European People's Party. A warm welcome to you both. And from the socialist Mitiadis Kirikos, and from the University of Graz, Florian Bieber, who is also the coordinator of the Balkan in Europe Policy Advisory Group project of European Funds for Balkans. OK, let's start off with you, Florian, and, and sort of set the scene because the Balkans isn't often in the news headlines these days. Today we have progress reports from all six aspirant Balkans countries, Serbia, Montenegro, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Bosnia, Kosovo and Albania. If it's possible, can you give us a pencil sketch of what, in your view, the biggest advances are in the uh, accession process and also what the biggest obstacles are? Oh, we have two countries which are in talks, Serbia and Montenegro, and that is certainly a big progress, that there is a continuous enlargement process going on and the talks really matter. But then we have about three countries, I would say, which face serious problems. One is Bosnia-Herzegovina for internal problems, political blockades. There were elections recently, and as a result, we don't see much progress towards the European Union and reforms for that matter. We have Kosovo, which has the challenge that is not recognized by five EU member states, and that eventually blocks its members to the EU down the road, um, although there are many other internal problems. It's not had a government for months. Um, and then finally Macedonia as well, which has uh, a name dispute unresolved with Greece and which also cr constitutes an obstacle and has resulted in a, I would say, increasingly authoritarian tendency within the country. Uh, and then we have a regional picture, a picture of countries which um, in many ways see EU moving away from them. And as a result, elites are less and less committed about EU enlargement. 90 years of Dayton agreement and Bosnia is still an open question. The perspective of Bosnia is still not clear. Uh, what's the problem with Bosnia? Well, partly it's the institutional setup of Bosnia, which is creating elites which are not accountable in many ways. So elections don't resolve the problem because essentially everybody's in power somewhere in Bosnia. So you can't really throw out politicians as easily and punish them for not governing uh, you well. And we see this, that the elections in October didn't really bring about a whole large-scale change of politics in Bosnia. It was hoped that the, um, the, the, the federation and the different, different ethnic entities would come together more closely within Bosnia and create a model which was against the way things had been during the, the, the program of ethnic cleansing and during the war. Has that happened at all? Yes, it, didn't, it didn't, didn't work like that, but I want to stress that after the elections, last elections, I still think that there is a ray of hope for the country because it's clearly falling back in the process. It's lagging behind all other countries in the region. But recently there are several meaningful initiatives on how to correct this. I mean the joint letter of the foreign minister of Germany and the UK, which uh, contained some new, very original ideas, how to change the situation and some other initiatives. And now I think they are going to be streamlined into one position of the whole EU. Uh, Friday this week, on the 5th of December, Commissioner Hahn and High Rep Mogherini are traveling to Sarajevo. So I think that this is a chance. Now is the chance for the political elite of Bosnia to show that they are interested in the European future. I think that Euro Europe should be more ambitious. European Union should be should uh, try to, to come up with, uh, with some common plan, with some common initiative. And I think that uh, uh, High, Com High Com uh, Representative Mogherini is showing uh, this will and, and interest, I, and she has the knowledge. Now it is up to how much of initiative the member states and their ministers will allow her. I think that, and I will stop with saying this, uh, I don't think that the, the Dayton framework allows uh, 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 really uh, to reform, to modernize 
the, the, the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovinian society. It doesn't work. Dayton Agreement was good to stop the war. It is not, uh, it, it is not a framework to build up a modern state. But Mr. Kirkos, if you look at the results of the elections and see the consolidation of the entrenched positions that were first established under Dayton, I mean, what hope do you think there is um, for the future, or what pathway out of these elites and out of this existing system do you think exists? I'm not an optimist that um, I can see any way out in uh, Bosnia. The entrenchments, as you refer to them, are very strong, and uh, the position there is, um, in my opinion, very, very difficult. That is not the case for the rest of the Western Balkans. We must not forget that these countries, as a uh, professor explained, are already in a way to the Balkans, either by being mem members to be or in uh, having specific problems to solve beco before becoming members. So it is uh, a process that must be encouraged. Let's go to Serbia, Mr. Uh, Bieber. What about Serbia? We, we, we saw recently an uh, open dilemma in Serbia, whether to go towards East or to stay with Europe. Well, I think it's partly a gamble of elites. They're saying, if you don't treat us better, uh, we're going to look to Russia. I think the statements like that of Milo Djukanovic and also statements by the Serbian government are suggesting that they want to keep good ties with Russia because that is popular uh, in their countries and to put pressure on the European Union. I don't think Russia is a real alternative in the region. It's not a real player. It can't really have the influence. I mean, let's not forget the Western Balkans are surrounded by the European Union, surrounded by NATO. Um, they are an island in the European Union. But Russia can create trouble if it wants to do so. I think there is another issue which should be mentioned in this connection and it is a very bad economic situation of the countries especially Serbia when they, they really need uh, some financial uh, assistance in order to deal with the everyday issues and Russia is ready to do that we are not let's let's face it if they ask for some financial assistance EU does not have it and Russia does so Russia is skillfully using also this moment and we shouldn't forget it i agree that Russia is not such a such a such a big player like uh, professor said but the countries i think that i believe the political leadership of Serbia and Montenegro that they sincerely want to have their countries in the EU. Well, I disagree here with my colleague uh, Kukan. Usually we agree, but this time I don't think that, that, that this kind of, uh, uh, of relation to Russia is a, a long-term uh, uh, situation in Europe. I think we should come slowly with Russia also to the to the normal terms. Uh, we should uh, work on the open problems. We should insist that Russia uh, is not allowed to 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 violate the international law. Should should withdraw from the occupied territories, but. In the long term, I don't accept that, 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 that uh, uh, Europe is building a wall against Russia. And what about on the question of Kosovo? Because if, if we stretch back our memories, it was Russian peacekeepers who barreled their way through Serbia into Kosovo as the first peacekeepers, in effect, in Kosovo in uh, 1999. Does Russia have a capacity in its potential leverage with the money that Mr. Kukan was saying is potentially available to influence Serbia on the critical Kosovo question? Well, I think L Russia has always li uh, leverage also in the Middle East and elsewhere. It is a superpower and it will stay a superpower. Okay, let's move on to that name question uh, and, and bring in you, Miltiadis Kirkos. Do you think that the European, it should be the European Union or the member, the member states of the European Union who should act as an honest broker rather than let the two countries sort out their problems themselves, which they appear incapable of doing up to this point? The question of the name is very clear. In my opinion, former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia, as is the official name, must choose a name that uh, makes it very clear that there is no confusion between that part of the world and the neighbor countries. We are totally agree that the place of former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia together with the rest of the West Balkans are in the European Union through a process that Mystic, makes these yeah. countries to be uh, in competence with the European laws, as we saw in the Bosnian results 
and as we saw in the tensions that erupt in the football grounds, nationalism is running rampart in the Balkans. So I'm not sure that this may be that you told us, maybe this will lead to the correct direction. I, in my opinion, the issue of the name is used as a way of uh, um, getting um, forces between um, getting forces behind a nationalist idea. I think that it makes absolutely no sense to to prevent uh, Macedonia to start negotiations. But the question for uh, uh, direct neighbors of the Western Balkans, northern neighbors Slovenia and southern neighbors uh, neighbor Greece, what uh, what what's your point of view? What what do you think? Uh, how Greece and Slovenia use their position? To, uh, to spread, to promote European values in, uh, in the Western Balkans? Well, Slovenia was trying to do it in the past. I will cut it short, uh, not to, to, to take the, too much of the time. But uh, Slovenia is too small, really, to, to be a major player in, in Balkans. And we have been uh, uh, dealing with our own uh, problems. Uh, we are on the friendly terms with everybody there and a lot of our expertise is there. So the governmental and non-governmental assistance to the, to the uh, different stages of negotiation, preparation for negotiation, etc. But strategically, I don't think that Slovenia can play more a role than it is playing now. Mr. Kirchhoff. If I remember correctly, in 2004, it was in uh, Greece, in Salonika, that uh, took place um, the first... Uh, 2003. 2003, the, yeah. first, the start of the enlargement of Europe to the Western Balkans. European so, perspective for the Western Balkans. Yes. So, um, yes, 2004 were the Olympics and everything <laughs> results on that. Yeah. So, uh, in my opinion, our position has not changed since. We are totally in favor of enlargement of the European Union for the Balkans. We want our neighbors to be in the European Union. The countries by themselves have to work hard to follow the rule of the law, the fundamental rights, the freedom of the press, the judicial integrity. Okay. So these are the rules. OK, we're going to go round the table with a concluding thought um, on the Balkans as a whole. Just 30 seconds each. We'll start off with you, uh, Mr. Kukan. Um, what is the price of failure? What do we stand to lose if we get it wrong? Price will be very high, very difficult, because we want to speak about the Europe one and the whole, and without the integration of the Western Balkan countries, we cannot say that we achieved our goal uniting Europe. That would be a very big price. Okay, Florian? Yeah. Well, I think the, it's the, the enlargement has been the big success story of the European Union. It's been really, uh, you know, 2004, 2007, despite all of the shortcomings, it's been able to increase in size in numbers of countries, transform the countries with all the difficulties. And it would be a main disaster if basically the European Union would fail to complete this process and also basically step away from its success story. Um, and that, I think, is fundamental. And if the EU doesn't do it, somebody else will uh, have influence in that region. There is no such thing as an empty region. And that, I think, will be negative, not just for the countries of the Western Balkans, but for the European Union. To have you know, seven small dictators uh, in the European Union's immediate surroundings with economic crisis can hardly be in the interest of the European Union. Well, I think that, uh, that uh, the process of enlargement is unavoidable. We, if you want a, a common Europe, in, in, in the sense of a common market, but also the place of common values, etc. The enlargement should be finished with the inclusion of all European countries in European Union. The, the, the otherwise, there will be, as my friend Kuken said, a very, very high price to, to, to pay. We should not forget that enlargement and European integration is also a peace process and as such it should be seen also in the future. Okay. That is my idea too. The price that we will pay is the price of people, of our neighbors living in conditions and economically and in the domain of freedoms that are not uh, for a European um, a member of the European uh, yeah. geographic place. So the only way to move forward is through enlargement. The way we can do it is 
all already written. We have just to follow the steps. Thank you. Okay, th that's all we have time for. I, I, I'm afraid many thanks to our guests for joining us, uh, Greek EMP Miltiadis Kirkos and Florian Bieber from the University of Graz. And Ivo Weigel from Slovenia and Edward Kokan from Slovakia. Many thanks to everyone for joining us and thanks to you too for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye.